Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. For you, it's what time exactly in the morning? Half past 10 in the morning in California. Ooh, it's very early birdie. Well, here it's already 7.30. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, I think what would be best, I asked you prior to this conversation, if it would be possible for you to, um, to search a piece from the book that you'd like to read to us. And you've chosen something from the very beginning of the book. And I think it's a wonderful beginning if you would just start with that and then we'll take on from there. Okay, just a second. <laughs> when I say that I was a feminist in kindergarten, even before the concept was known in my family, I'm not exaggerating. I was born in 1942. So we are talking remote antiquity. I believe that the situation of my mother, Panchita, triggered my rebellion against male authority. Her husband abandoned her in Peru with two toddlers in diapers and a newborn baby. Panchita was forced to return to her parents' home in Chile, where I spent the first years of my childhood. My anger against machismo started in those childhood years of seeing my mother and the housemaids as victims. They were subordinate and had no resources or voice. My mother, because she had challenged convention and the maids because they were poor. Of course, back then I didn't understand any of this. I was only able to do so in my fifties after spending some time in therapy. However, even if I couldn't reason, my feelings of frustration were so powerful that they marked me forever. I became obsessed with justice and developed a visceral reaction to male chauvinism. This resentment was an aberration in my family, which considered itself intellectual and modern, but according to today's standards, they were frankly paleolithic. Panchita consulted several doctors trying to find out what was wrong with me. Maybe her daughter suffered from colic or tapeworm an obstinate and defiant character was accepted in my brothers as an essential condition of masculinity, but in me, it would only be pathological. Isn't it always thus? Girls are denied the right to be angry, to trash about. Feminism often sounds scary because it seems too radical or, it interp or is interpreted as hatred of men. Before continuing, I must clarify this for some of my readers. Let's start with the term patriarchy. Originally, it meant the absolute supremacy of men over women, over other species and over nature. But feminist movement has undermined that absolute power in some aspects, although in others, it persists as it has for thousands of years. Although many discriminatory laws have been changed, the patriarchy continues to be the prevalent system for political, economic, cultural, and religious oppression. It grants dominion and privileges to the male gender. Aside from misogyny, contempt for women, this system includes diverse forms of exclusion and aggression, racism, homophobia, classism, xenophobia, and intolerance of different ideas and people. Patriarchy is imposed with aggression. It demands obedience and punishes those who defy it. And what is my definition of feminism? It is not what we have between our legs, but what we have between our ears. It's a philosophical posture, an uprising against male authority. It's a way of understanding human relations and a way to see the world. It's a commitment to justice and a struggle for the emancipation of women, the LGBTQIA plus community, anyone oppressed by the system, including some men and all others who want to join us. Welcome, the greater the number, the better. In my youth, I fought for equality. I wanted to participate in the men's game, but in my mature years, I've come to realize that the game is folly. It is destroying the planet and the moral fabric of humanity. Feminism is not about replicating the disaster. It's about mending it. As a result, of course, it confronts powerful reactionary forces like fundamentalism, fascism, tradition, and many others. 
it's depressing to see that among the opposition forces are so many women who fear change and cannot imagine a different future. The patriarchy is stony. Feminism, like the ocean, is fluid, powerful, deep, and encompasses the infinite complexity of life. It moves in waves, currents, tides, and sometimes in storms. Like the ocean, feminism never stays quiet. Thank you so much. What a powerful beginning of your book. Thank you so much. Well, already the first sentence in the book is that you're not exaggerating if you're stating that you were five years old when you became a feminist in kindergarten. Could you please elaborate on how a five-year-old expresses feminism? Anger, a lot of anger. Uh, anger uh, towards who? Towards authority, towards men, towards male authority. And it was a mixture of things because I was angry at my grandfather's authority. He was a big patriarch, but I also adored him and I admired him. And many of the macho things that he instilled in me have been very useful in my life, like hard work, discipline, don't complain, be strong, um, be independent. All those things that, that were supposed to be masculine traits that my grandfather instilled in me have helped me to survive yeah because um nobody really talked about it in your time like the concept of feminism uh, not at school not at home not in the press where did you get the sense of it where did you get the idea of its existing i didn't get the idea of feminism that 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 i learned in my teenage years in retrospect you understood it when you were a five-year-old and your anger came from from there, but but of course it didn't have a name. No. I, and I, I couldn't say that I was angry because of something or just as something. I, it was a general sense of how unfair the world was. And you know, children have a very keen sense of fairness. When you give a candy to one and you don't give a candy to the other one, they really notice immediately. And many animals do too. I have two dogs, be careful not to give a treat to one and not the other. So I had that, that sense of fairness, that, that desire for justice. I was very aware of how, um, how vulnerable my mother and the other women in the house were. And those women were the maids. Uh, they, they had two or three maids in the house, living in the house, who were not, not slaves, of course, but, but servants in, in a very, I would say in a very abusive way. And, and, and could you give me some like concrete examples of how um, their state of being was contradictory to what the men um, were doing in the household or what their position was? This was a household of maids. My mother yeah. arrived at her father's house with three yeah. babies, but my uncles who were a bachelor were living in the house and my grandfather soon became a widower, was. The, the, the big figure in the house. And the house was sort of, it, it had like an invisible frontier. The front of the house, the library, the, the, the living room, the dining room, the, my grandfather's quarters, all that was like the front of the house. And in the back lived the children and the women. <laughs> this is in 1942, this of course has changed. Nobody yeah. has houses that big and maids or anything like that in Chile anymore, thank God. And, um, my mother had, of course, lived in the house. My grandfather paid the bills and he paid for our schooling, but my mother didn't have any cash. She never had any money for herself. She couldn't buy ice cream for us because she didn't work. So my, according to my grandfather, he who pays the bills gives the orders. So having the power of controlling the purse was extremely important. And I realized that very young very, very young, that the first thing I wanted as soon as possible was to make a living and be independent. The, Could the, you describe that as your your first feminist action, let's say? One second. Get a job? Like, no, one second. I'm so sorry. I, what, what happened? <laughs> I don't know. There was a sound. I'm so sorry. No, that, that's okay. I, I would say that, that the first... Um, the first thing was uh, try to protect my mom, try to give my mom what she didn't have, 
Then later, my mother remarried and she married uh, my stepfather who be later became my best friend and a wonderful father. But I resented him terribly because he was very male chauvinistic. He was um, old fashioned. So uh, for him- In what sense? Could you give an example of how- of For example, he would, he, he would be very gentle uh, with women. He would pull the chair and open the doors but had absolutely no respect for a woman's intellect or, or, or professionally. And um, all the, the, the focus in the family was to make my brothers professionals and have them be successful. I was supposed to get married and have kids. I never went to college. And I was always the first student in my class, but that was not important for a girl. For a girl, what was important was to be charming. And I wasn't. Never and you, <laughs> and you, you even said in a book that at a certain extent, to a certain point, you wanted to be a man. Well, I think that that's in my generation, something that many women wanted because we, the, the future for a boy was so much more interesting and open than for a girl. Yeah. And unless you were totally indoctrinated into what your role was in the world, you would rebel against it. You wanted more. And then uh, for a younger generation, some of my generation as well, especially in the middle class, in Chile, we had a very good education system that was free. And so uh, in the middle class, many, many women became professionals at that time. But in the upper classes, we went to private schools. And, and the, 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 way they, the way we were taught was that we would occupy a place in society that we were, it was not needed for us to be professionals. Of course, there were exceptions and that has changed completely. Uh, so I did want to be a man for, for a while. And then in, in my puberty, I realized that something was changing in my body and that I couldn't stop it. Yeah. And then you know, the hormones kick in and then you want to comply. You want to be like everybody else. You want to be accepted. You want to be beautiful. All the things that, was, that you were supposed to be. So I was a tomboy until my, my puberty. And then everything changed and I became the most unhappy adolescent in the world. Yeah, you, you give an um, occasional description uh, on behalf of all women in the book. Um, for example, you say every woman is afraid, uh, but also you tell them uh, what they want. You, you, you state what they want. All women want safety, want to be appreciated, want to live in peace, um, have their own resources, as we just talked about, uh, connectedness, love. But is that a typical feminine thing? Isn't that also something that every man desires too? Most men have it. So of course they decide, but they take it for granted. Most men take respect for granted, safety for granted. Mm -hmm. Let me give you an example. A, a woman uh, walking alone at night in the street is very cautious, very careful. She, she's, she feels vulnerable. She feels that if she doesn't go in the, where the light is and accompany it, there's risk. A man doesn't even think about it. For him, the street is like the house, perfectly safe. For, for women, not even the house is safe. Uh, respect, they get it. Resources, they have it. Mm -hmm. So most of the things that I'm talking about are the things that are traditionally denied to women. And women have to double the effort than any man to get it. Yeah, because you, you, in the beginning you said that you wanted to make very sure that we understood your definition of feminism and it has nothing to do with hatred towards men. But no, sometimes but it, has to, it has to do, we, we don't hate men, but this is no. a word is the patriarchy, which yeah. is a symptom. No, because sometimes in a book you do uh, make generalizing statements about men um, and occasionally I get the idea that there are no good men, but you love them too. Of course. I have I'm read married. a lot about love in the book too. <laughs> yeah, and I've been married three times. And I, yes. like, <laughs> I do like- We'll get to that. <laughs> and I have the most wonderful son. Yeah. So this is not against men. This is against the system. Yeah. And it, it, is, it is much bigger 
than just the. Do you think that the system is um, depending on the cultural in the, in the culture you live in or the country you live in? For example, you you have been talking a lot about the machismo in the country you come from. Is it comparable to other parts of the world where there's less machismo, for example? I mean, I mean I, I'm talking to you from Holland and the things you describe in your book are not as familiar to me, perhaps, as being brought up in Chile or wherever in Latin America. Yeah, Ronit, how old are you? I'm 36. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you, you, you don't have a saying in this. Oh, Talk I don't. To... Tell me why not. <laughs> Talk to your grandmother and see how ch things have changed in every yeah. generation. They have changed in Chile, of course. Yeah. And many young women in Chile today would not recognize any of But I was people. shocked about the fact that divorce, for example, that until 2005, I think you stated, that, that divorce was not even an option there. Not I mean, option. no, it's incredible. So even- and, well, That gives you an idea that some yeah. countries are different. And yeah. now go to the Middle East, go to some places in, in Asia, and, and you will see that the situation of women is way worse than it was in Chile then. And uh, I, I have a foundation. We work empowering women and girls. And when I say that, that there's a war against women, I know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, women are exposed to all the risks, and they are very vulnerable everywhere, in some places way worse than in others. For example, femicide today in Mexico is it's a humanitarian crisis. Yeah, and nobody talks about it. Very, they they talk about it, but very little. And, and also in Turkey, Turkey, where the government. Uh, yeah. yeah. So so uh, and, and, unless women get out in the streets and protest and make their voice heard, it, it just happens. It's part of the culture or religion. There are religions in which men pray to God to thank God because they were not born women. There's a reason for that, isn't it? Uh, because you also described that, that at the age 15, you turn away from religion, or at least from the church. Do you sometimes miss it? No. Never? Never. Because, Never. Uh, no? No. What, what's, what's... I have a spiritual practice that I, I grew a group with whom we, we have a spiritual practice, and that's enough for me. And I do believe that there's much more than the material world and the mind. But no organized religion for me ever. Um, we were just talking about the Majoism, and I was wondering if you could um, elaborate a little bit of that on the origin of where it comes from, because in your country it was so obvious. While in other countries it's it's yeah it's really less the Machoism. I was wondering if you can say something about the history of the Machoism in your country, where it comes from, what in what it's pushed it. But it is, as I said before, patriarchy has been there for thousands of years mm -hmm. and it manifests in different forms, but it gives supremacy and power to the male gender in many aspects. And now in modern times with communication, with technology, with the feminist movement and, and many other movements that are fighting for a different world, things are beginning to change and they have changed way more in the West in, the Euro in European countries, in, in some parts of the United States, and way less in other places in the world. Mm -hmm. And unless the, the feminist movement achieves its goal for every woman in the world, we still have work to do. Yeah, I, I get a lot of questions in the, in the box, but I will get to them, I think, in the end of our conversation. Um, I was thinking at a certain point while I was reading your book, I was thinking of Anna Karenina and where the first sentence, uh, it says, happy families are all alike and every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Because you describe, I think, two times that um, having an unhappy childhood is also a source of, of being a good writer, I guess. Um, <laughs> Well, at least it's very inspiring. <laughs> it's very inspiring, yeah, yeah. Well, it's a, it's a frequently heard phrase, of course. Uh, I was wondering whether you knew some writers who are, um, that you admire, who have had good childhoods. I don't know much about other people's childhoods because not everybody talks about it. No. 
Uh, no, but, but where does inspiration and stories come from? From inquiry, from asking yourself why things don't work, why, why there is pain, why, why am I suffering mm -hmm. or others are suffering? And then you get the stories. So um, it's, it, it's, I think, harder for someone who has grown up with a sense of happiness and safety to be a formidable creator of any kind. Yeah. But it's not impossible. Um, at, at one hand, you, you are very optimistic, uh, in a sense, in your book, but there is also a lot of, um, uh, there is a lot of hopefulness and combative, but it's also terrifying. Uh, for instance, you state that no one can be trusted. Is there no one in your life that you trust? I don't think I said that in the book. It, well, in the Dutch book, it said, no, no one can be trusted. It is. Well, depends I, for what? It depends for what? <laughs> I think that. that I can't uh, find uh, it now uh, at the moment, but. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that maybe the idea is that you don't trust your life to anybody in the sense that you are in charge of your life. Don't blame anybody else. You are in charge. Yeah. Unless, of course, you are a prisoner or something. But uh, of course, how can you how can you live without trust? I, I wouldn't trust, know. First of all, I trust myself very much, mm -hmm. and then I trust many women and a few men too, and that's why I'm married. Yeah, we'll get to the marriage at the end of our conversation. I hope, like it's also in the end of the book. But let let us talk a little bit about your mother because in the book. You call her Panchita, not so much your mother. Why is that? Why you call her by her name? Everybody called her Panchita. Ah, and okay. Everybody. <laughs> and uh, and she, she died a couple of years ago. I miss her terribly. And Imagine. after she died, many people talk to me about Panchita. They don't say your mother. Panchita mm -hmm. was just, just herself. Not, it didn't matter if she was my mother or not. She was mm -hmm. just her. She was Panchita to everyone. Panchita always, yes. Mm -hmm. um, she was a big inspiration for you, I understand from the book. Could you please tell our listeners who maybe have not read the book yet, what was so inspiring about her? First of all, by contrast, I didn't want to have her life. My mother mm -hmm. was aggressively dependent all her life. She, she could never make a living for herself or support her kids. That made her dependent and therefore, vulnerable. Um, when I was growing up, I tried fiercely to make my mother independent, to make her a feminist, but, but I was trying to inject feminism to someone who was born 20 years before I did and who was raised in a very different way. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> that was a useless task. Uh, but she, she inspired me in the sense that I didn't want to be like her, and on the other hand, she was an extraordinary person. She was creative. Uh, she was a very good painter who never, never could uh, explore seriously how good she was. Mm -hmm. she, never, she never studied because she, she never trusted that she had any talent. And nobody else did either because, because nobody paid any attention to her. My, mother was, so my mother's role was the wife of a diplomat. So she was praised when the house was beautiful with the flowers, the silver shining, the, the banquets. That was her role, not painting at all. Mm -hmm. And my mother also was my best friend. We corresponded a letter a day for decades. Uh, when email was invented, we would communicate during the day, sometimes more than one letter a day. And uh, recently my son, saw so that many of the old letters that I have collected, I collected every letter, were deteriorating because the paper was very, very thin. The, the typewriters were making holes in the paper. And he decided to digitalize the whole thing. And we hired a company to digitalize the letters. And we calculate that there are 24,000 letters in boxes. Wow. Of That's my mother's whole life and my whole life. They are all in yeah. letters. So that relationship, that intimacy of that correspondence with my mother 
uh, created a bond that not even death has been able to break. Wow, that's very impressive. Um, you do uh, elaborate a lot on your on the bond you have with your mother and the intimacy too. But at a certain point, you also write that um, a lot of readers, your readers, asked for from you to write erotic novels, and that you wouldn't dare because of your mother. <laughs> <laughs> but on the other hand, you were so, I don't know, there were so uh, little taboos, I think, because in the book, it's its striking how, how easily you talk about all the taboos we have in our lives. And it's something you want to break through. But apparently there were some taboos left between you and your mother. No, we could talk about eroticism. My mother, for example, watched TV at night in the middle of the night, and she would be surfing on the TV and sometimes stumble upon some pornography. So she would put on her glasses and watch very carefully. And <laughs> she would write me a letter describing everything she saw in, in, in the porn site. Uh, so we, we didn't have any, any problem talking about it among ourselves, but my mother was very, uh, um, very preoccupied with what other people thought. So that's one of the things that worried her about me. Uh, I've always lived abroad. I've been away from Chile for 40 years, but I would go all the time to visit. And my mother was terrified that, that I would go on TV or something and talk about abortion. Because I said, please, please, just, just I, I understand it's important, but you don't have to talk in public about that. So for my mom, there were certain things that you, that you, had, you never did in public. She was very yeah. elegant, my mother. So um, eroticism was one thing that we could discuss and practice, but not, not exactly discuss it in public. But although I have many erotic scenes in my books, and yes. my mother would say, why do you have to go into details? People will think that you have done it. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. yeah. Well, what is so interesting is that you say that a lot of what she did or thought was depending on what the people around her thought about her. And for you, it was a completely different thing. Do you think it is something that can be taught to a person or does it come from within, because from you, when you read the book, it's like you were born with that sense of anatomy, uh, of having your own voice, of not really caring about other people, what they think or what they do. You have your own voice and you listen to it. Is it something that you are born with naturally? Can you learn it or? I don't know. I, I, I was, as I said, an angry child, an unhappy child. And that helped me to have, to look for my, 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 myself. And, uh, and because I adored my mother, but I didn't want to be like her, I separated, my personality was very different from my mom's. And I have never been afraid of what other people think of me. I don't care. I really don't care. But you don't, uh, when you have a bad review on a book, for example, I don't you don't care. Thing. No. When you were not, you were not granted the literary prize for so long in your country. It was because of who you were, not so much about your books. It was a big accomplishment for you when you finally got that recognition. Yeah, and I'm very grateful. Mm -hmm. But but not but because you care. care. So I don't care if I get an award or a doctorate. I have 60 awards and, and 13 honorary degrees. I don't want any more, and I and I didn't want those, I didn't want those either. What what I love about my work is the process. I, I love to put a story together like a puzzle, uh, to find the sentence that will create an emotion in my reader, to get back the feed the feedback of the readers who say, "This book changed my life," or "I had I read your book, Paula, and for the first time in eighteen years, I contacted my mother." That mm -hmm. kind of stuff that is worth uh, 10 awards. So yeah. that's what I care about. Yeah. Um, you mentioned her name, Paula. Uh, she was your daughter who passed away at age 29. She's also one of your inspirations. She's one of the women that you admire a lot. You've written a book about her. Um, and there is um, your literary agent, Carmen, I have to look up the name, Balses. Balses. Yeah. Well, says, yes. Um, you also see you you see them both too as 
as inspirations for, for you. So could you tell me what Panchita, Paula and Carmen, what they share, what the three of them share that is so inspirational to you? Profound honesty, decency. Yeah, my, my mother loved me unconditionally and I understood my mother perfectly. I knew her from every angle. My daughter was an old soul. She was born wise. She was very little and she was already a wise human being. Um, amazingly, I think that she had the premonition that she wasn't going to live long. So she didn't want stuff, nothing that would clutter her life. She didn't want more clothes than the few hangers she had in the closet. She didn't want anything extra, just what is necessary to have a comfortable minimum life. And Carmen Balcells was a force of nature. She was a powerful woman, this Catalan warrior that uh, at the time when she became a literary agent, nobody really fought for the rights of the writers. The publishers would buy a book for life. There was no end to the contracts. So a publisher could buy a manuscript and never publish it. And no one else could because it belonged to that publisher. And uh, Carmen changed the way the relationship between publish the publishing houses and the writers was and defending and defended um, writers of the Spanish language in Spain and all over Latin America. Um, she, was, she gave me advice that I have never forgotten. Um, once she said, she saw me very sort of, not afraid, but, but shy in, in a huge party that she threw to introduce me to the intelligentsia of Spain when I wrote the House of the Spirits and I was nobody. And I, and, and I was shy, I didn't know anybody. I felt totally awkward. She took me aside and she said, relax here, nobody knows anything. We are all improvising. And that, that was so wonderful that I realized that, yeah, we are all improvising in life anyhow. So I take, I take that as, as a way of conducting my life often when I feel that I am not entitled to something or when I feel awkward in, in, in a meeting or in a place, everybody's improvising. Everybody's well, more afraid are. than me. Yeah. yeah. Are there also, because there are a lot of women in the book that you admire, also writers, you write about them, uh, Margaret Atwood, for example, uh, she's an inspiration for you. And I was wondering whether you have male examples too. There are many male writers that are extraordinary. I, uh, I belong to the first generation of Latin American writers to grow up yeah. reading the big writers of the boom. Those, yeah. those incredible writers that were a choir of very different voices, uh, but very harmonious voices, presenting Latin America to the world and presenting Latin America to us. So we knew who we were because of these great works of literature. And I read them all. And they are all they all influenced me, I am absolutely sure. But maybe for, for our today, listeners, you excuse me. And today I read a lot of male writers, of course. But maybe you can give some examples of the writers that have been influencing you a lot at that time, because I think maybe our listeners would want to hear what in, what writers inspire you. Well, in the, the writers from the boom in Spanish, the great ones that I, that I admired and I think influenced me a lot was Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Mario Vargas Llosa, Jose Donoso, Pablo Neruda, Jorge yeah. Luis Borges, Juan Rulfo, and I could name 20 more. Well, they're, they are big names. <laughs> it's wonderful also that in your book, you, you, put, uh, uh, you, put, you mix it with, with poetry. So they're all very um, uh, tiny chapters and mixed with poetry, it's wonderfully done. Um, uh, well, your son, you just mentioned him also, he works for the um, foundation. We've talked about your daughter, Paula. Could you tell us a little bit what kind of mother you have been to them? What were the helpful lessons that you taught them? 
first of all, I have to thank the people who helped me to be a mother because I worked sometimes two or three jobs simultaneously. Mm -hmm. I was always working, always doing something else than motherhood. But I had a wonderful mother-in-law who lived next door and helped me raise my, my kids. I have an adopted grandmother, not my mother, because my mother was the wife of a diplomat. She was never there. And I had the maids in the house who helped me, the, the nannies who helped me raise my kids as well. And I'm extremely grateful to them and to the teachers that also helped me. So I cannot say that motherhood for me was a burden because I had a lot, a lot of help. And I was also the, the kind of mother that uh, would be mildly uh, neglectful, neglectful. I would, I was not hovering over my kids. My kids were really independent. They, they were really little and they would walk to school. That was possible then, it's not possible now. But they would walk to school or bike to school. Uh, they did their homework. They, they would go alone to the dentist. They, would, they, they were really independent from a very early age because I was just not there enough. And I, for, a, for a long time, I absorbed the guilt that society puts on women who are mothers. And that if, you, if anything happens to your kid, or if your kid doesn't turn out as good as you expect, it's your fault. It's the mother's fault, always. So I had some of that because you cannot escape it. But in life, I realized that my children, both Paula and Nico, had told me many times that I was always present. They, they, don't, they don't remember me as an absent mother because I think that emotionally, I was always there with them. I don't know. I, I do. was like, the kids were born, were born very special, both of them. Um, you do describe a sad part, I imagine, in your life that you abandoned your children because the love you had for another man, you left your husband, you left your children. And at that point, they must have felt abandoned because you said that it took some years in order to restore the contact. Um, that was quite a big decision. I was wondering if you still understand the woman back then who did that. Yes. Did it have something? Yeah. I, I do understand her. And I wish I could talk to her and say, don't do it. Don't do it. It's not worth it. I was in love, of course. And terribly disappointed with my marriage, living in exile in Venezuela, where I couldn't find a job. I, I didn't know anybody, we didn't have any money. My life was very frustrating. And I met this fascinating Argentinian musician who was exactly the opposite of my husband. And I fell in love and I followed him to Spain and was away for a month or so. But uh, that was enough to break the trust of my kids who felt abandoned. I returned and, and in time was able to regain that trust. The connection was never broken, but, but of course they felt abandoned and I did abandon them. So if I could go back, I, I wish I couldn't do it, but I understand why I did it. And how do you regain trust? By presence, by being there being there, available, and by talking. I, I have never made a mystery of this. I have, a, I have tried at the beginning, I tried to talk to my kids, explain, they wouldn't listen because they were too young. But then later, I think they, I have been able to explain and, and to ask for forgiveness. Uh, I remember that when I asked Nico, to, I apologized, I said, Nico, the more I think about my past, and now that I'm writing about my past, I feel that I owe you a terrible apology, a huge apology. And Nico thanked me. And he said that, that he was grateful that I could see it that way because yes, there had been a lot of suffering. Mm -hmm. I think, of course, he, he could forgive me. Yeah. Well, one of your strongest light motives in the book is, is to insist on independence. Um, that even as applies to lipstick, because it's an illusion you write to improve us a lot. Um, yet you state you are also vain, and um, and at least on the cover of your book, 
there's a lot of lipstick. Of course. <laughs> yeah. yes. So could you, could you tell me what you mean by it? Well, when I say that I'm vain, it's because I am. I love mm -hmm. makeup and, and, and clothes and flowers, and I want my house to look lovely. And, uh, and th 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 there's a, a sort of mixture between vanity and, and a desire for refinement that I inherited from my mother. Mm -hmm. um, but I am very aware that we women are victims of an industry that, that starts by making us feel that we are not good enough. That if we wear makeup, we will look better. That if we tint our hair, we will look better. That clothes and fashion are indispensable because if you don't follow fashion, you are not in and so forth. That you have to have a certain weight, a certain shape. And for that, even surgery is applicable, anything. Uh, so I, I, I am very aware that that's a form of slavery and we have to, part of what the feminist movement needs to do is transform that. I just had a very interesting conversation um, with Maria Gracia Curie, who is the designer for Dior. And we were both interviews in the, in the recent issue of Harper's Bazaar. And we were talking about this, talking about fashion and about beauty and about how, how she as a designer and me as an older writer, try to change the concept of what is what women should wear or not. They can wear whatever they want. They can be whoever they want. There are all kinds of shapes and all kinds of forms, and that's fine. But your uh, husband cannot. Very interesting conversation. <laughs> what? But your husband cannot. You tell him what he has to wear. I read from oh, your yeah. book. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it was a very funny part. Yeah. He has no yeah. taste. So <laughs> yeah. He's actually a very good person and puts up with me. We, we don't have a lot of time left, so I'm sorry that we have to skip a little bit because I would, I would very much like to talk to you about aging because this is also a very interesting and big part of the book. And I was wondering what you could describe as the biggest misconceptions exist about aging and being a sensual being as you call yourself. Well, to begin with, I, I have to say that aging is one issue that the feminist movement has forgotten. So um, fe the feminist movement is, when we think of it, it's young women or, or medium aged women. Mm -hmm. And we never think that the old grandmothers are part of it as well. Um, uh, the, as I said, the, the feminist movement forgets aging and, the, and society and the world pushes aside the older people. We live in a society focused on youth, beauty, and success. And if you, you are not in that niche, you are, you are out. And as you age, you are pushed more and more to the margins. Women become invisible as soon as the reproductive years end, they start to become invisible. And they start doing all kinds of things to look younger because they don't want to be invisible and they don't want to be marginalized. In my experience, if you have health, if you are not crazy, but if you are healthy and have resources, enough resources to live a, a, a relatively decent life, there's no reason why you should feel that you are not valuable, that you are not part of society, that you are not sensual, Look, people think that older people don't need love, sex, um, uh, all the things that young people do, we do. It's, it's, the, it's the same and it's even more sometimes because we have less. As you age, you, you sort of get rid of all the extra stuff and you keep what is essential. And among the essential things for an older person, I would say health, resources, love, and community. You need to belong. Yeah. Um, so let, let, let us conclude because in the book you, you said that you um, just married your current husband, Roger, 
I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his name right. And you said it's going to be a challenge of you two bringing all this time together because of Corona. And I was just wondering how it ended. Although Corona has not completely ended yet, I was wondering uh, whether you are coping. Well, we spent 15 months in lock, locked in the house, in a very small house, in an yeah. eternal honeymoon. And actually, we haven't killed each other. And we are still oh, together. That's good so, <laughs> So it worked, you know, it was, a, it was a, an opportunity to get to know each other in ways we probably would have never been able to do without. In what him. sense? In what sense? What did you well, get to know well, about him? First of all, when you live inside, you don't have all the crutches of the external world. You don't have the friends, you don't have the restaurant, you don't have the vacation, you have anything. You just have the two naked people with their souls confronted. And it's like a Sartre play, you know? It's just two people in a room. And uh, so we, we don't fight, but we talk a lot and we have to share everything. And that is for me a new experience. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm gonna read some uh, questions that we got from the Q&A. Um, from Frederick Hauptmann. Um, what do you think about introducing quotas to help women to reach top functions? It's important, the quotas are important, uh, not only for women, sometimes for other races, for minorities, for, it's important to incorporate into society those people who have been marginalized. And there will be a point when quotas will be not necessary anymore. But right now is one way of coping with all the injustice and their the unfairness of the system. Um, I have a very interesting question that I was wondering myself to of Patricia Nani, who writes, are you going to write a book about the correspondence with your mother? No. 24,000 letters. No, no, no. It's too uh, intimate. The deal with my mom was that if she died before, I would burn the letters. If I died before, she would burn the letters, but I couldn't do it. So my son will have to do it when I die. No, this is very intimate, very personal. We could, we could write, we, we did write in a totally open, not censored way, the gossip, the horrible things we said about my stepfather or about my husband's. I mean, it was, like, I don't even yeah. published. <laughs> no. No. Sunni uh, Stelps, uh, writes, I'm intrigued by you being an unhappy child. Are you happy now? And if so, when did it change? Or is it another feeling? My life changed when I fell in love for the first time. I was 17 years old, or 16. And I met the man who would become my first husband and the father of my children. And the first time that somebody held my hand and kissed me, everything changed. Everything, I, I felt like a something opened inside like, I don't know, like a flower. And my life changed. The, not my commitment to, for justice or feminism or my desire to be independent or none of it. But there was something emotional inside that was tight and opened up with love. And I, my, my determination to be happy started then and exploded when I had my two children. The moment I could hold my babies against my breast when they were born was the happiest moment, both happiest yeah. moments of my life. But then along my life, and I have lived a long life, um, I have had moments of great sadness and tragedy and, and suffering and, moment, and very good moments as well. Mm -hmm. But I have a very selective memory. I remember the good, and I tend to forget the bad. So if you ask me, have you had a happy life? I would say, yes, a very happy life. And right now my life is perfect because I have what I said before, the things that are needed for a happy old age. Um, I asked you before um, what the lessons were that you taught your children and somebody is asking what the lessons were that you, your children taught you. Oh, Paula taught me extreme generosity. But Paula's mantra was, you only have what you give. The more you give, the more you have. 
give until it hurts. And that extreme generosity, which marked my life after she died and allowed me to create a foundation has given me the greatest rewards and happiness. So that was a huge lesson. She also taught me to unclutter my life, have only what you use. Do not accumulate anything because you will die and you, and you will take with you nothing. So don't accumulate honors, don't accumulate silverware, don't accumulate people that you are not interested in. Just stay with what is essential. My son, Nicolas, is the most honest, straightforward, decent person I've ever known. I have known him for 53 years and he never lies. And he's willing to confront me when he knows that it's going to be very hard because he doesn't, he doesn't lie. So uh, he, will, he will tell me what is true. Uh, Nico is the, one of the very few men I have met in my life who has not a trace of male chauvinism. And he has taught me how that can be achieved. Because for me, it was a fight, a struggle. Uh, uh, I was always with, with weapons in my hands to, to fight against the patriarchy. The angry girl from five the years old. Girl. And he has taught me that often what is more effective is humor and kindness. And, and it's and also what you used in Paula, right? It was yeah. uh, when you worked for the feminist magazine, you used humor as a way of expressing very serious topics. But in his adult life, Nico, who works for the foundation, his job is to empower women and girls with his wife. This is what they do. Mm -hmm. uh, Nico has, is very strong, but soft. He's never cruel. He's never aggressive. He's never, and he achieves everything I do and better without any of the anger. So that is a huge lesson that he has taught me. Uh, Boris asks a question uh, about um, your writing because you've written a, a thriller, Ripper, and many novels. Was writing a thriller a different experience for you? Yes, a totally different experience. I attended for years um, a conference for mystery writers. Every year in the summer I would go because it's a genre that I'm not particularly a fan of mysteries, but I find the, the, the structure of a mystery, of a crime novel, very interesting because it's about, it's a game between the reader and the writer. The reader proposes a story and plants the red herrings so that he, the writer gives you all the clues to guess who is the assassin, but also disguises those clues so well that you might not guess. So if you guess as a reader, I lose as a writer. But if you don't guess, I win as a writer and you lose as a reader. So that game is very interesting for me. And I did one uh, and one crime novel, and now there is a, an option for a movie. And so forth, I haven't read that book in years. So now I'm going to read it again to see how, how I did it, but I yeah. have never done it again. Great. Uh, an anonymous attendee asked, perhaps she or he sees you as a love guru. Why do you think that most loves die out sooner or later? Rarely you can see long, happy marriages. All of a sudden divorce is there. Because we live too long. <laughs> <laughs> The idea, the idea of a monogamous marriage was established when people, the average time that people lived was 35, 50 years old. And now we live to be 90 and we are expected to be with the same person for 65 years, sleeping in the same bed and in a monogamous relationship. That How long will you and Roger last? You still have so <laughs> well, many years to go. No, 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 that's the thing. My, my love affairs last around 20 years. And then, the, ah. then there are like eight or nine more years in which I try to fix it. Never works. <laughs> but now I don't have 20 years with Roger. So probably he will be my, my last love. But I'm not sure. If he, so, if he dies before I do, probably I will marry a fourth time. Why not? I could marry not? at 90. 
Um, Karin Luxmoising asks, do you think there is a kind of six signature you have as a writer, a significant different perspective because you're from Chile uh, compared to Europe? If you can uh, describe what makes it different. Everybody's different. And there is, a, in, in the United States, um, there's this idea that uh, writers who come from other places, let's say, Hosseini, who comes from Afghanistan, or someone who comes from Africa, or me from Chile or from Mexico, we bring with us our culture and our traditions and whatever, and that gives a certain flavor to the book, and it is true. There is a certain flavor that you bring in. It's your experience, your life yeah. as being the roots that you have in another place, your memories. Uh, I, I realize that my writing, my inspiration always goes back to the house of my grandfather in Chile when I was little. Mm -hmm. and, and that marked me so profoundly. And that is a different experience from the experience of any child in the United States. Yeah. I was watching uh, some documentaries about Hemingway and about Mark Twain, for example, and they focus very much on childhood. And you realize that they're both American writers, but they come from different places and they are such different people and such different writers. So yeah. it is true that, that uh, you bring with you a lot from your background. I have a remark here from Juliana Fontaise. She says, being a feminist and having a foundation to empower women. Um, so I wonder why you do not think of new terms to call the so-called mates or servants. I find these terms maid servant very demeaning. It is demeaning today. It was not then. Mm -hmm. That's how you call them then. And today you would, call, in, in Chile, they are, Asistentes del hogar, that would be assistant to the home, which uh, to me is a euphemism for something that st is still there. But there was, there is today no, um, no, it's not a pejorative term. People in Chile call them nannies. Everybody's a nan, la nana, la nana. You can call them whatever you want, but the fact is that there are so mostly women who work in a household and their, their job today has changed, but then was a very, a very uh, it was a servant really in, in ways that, that today we don't, we don't even imagine it here in the West, but in other places they still exist. Um, I have a question for Mianne Levart. Uh, about the current situation. What are your thoughts on how the pandemic has impacted women's progress in society? We have gone back. Women have been the first one to lose their jobs during the pandemic and will be the last ones to recover it. They are stuck at home taking care of their children and most of the domestic work. Domestic violence has increased everywhere because of the pandemic. Women are locked inside sometimes with an abuser and there's no help available. Um, women everywhere have suffered and will it, it will take an effort of the government and of the society to, to diminish that gap that we'll, we will see very clearly at the end of the pandemic. At this point, Biden, the president here, is trying to pass a law, establish daycare for all children free because which we don't have in the United States, of course. And, and the, the daycare here is private and very expensive. So how do you bring women back to work? You, somebody has to take care of the kids. And so that is one of the, of the measures that the government is taking to try to, re, to give women some of what they had before. But we've lost a lot. And what's Most, what? There has been a lot of violence against women, a lot. But what was it like for you? This is my own question, an extra. I'm sorry, I'm adding. What was it like for you to live in the United States with a president, Trump, who was so hatredful about women? It was horrible. It was four toxic years, not only yeah. for me, for half the population. Yeah. A, a time of lies, of misogyny, terrible treatment of, of refugees at the border. Uh, terrible. I mean, separating families, putting children in cages. They took away babies from the arms of their mothers who were breastfeeding. That's what was happening in the United States with Trump. So, of course, it was a terrible time. 
But did you think of leaving? Trump did not cause all this. He's a symptom. He is mm -hmm. part, he represents something that exists in the society. A large portion of the society in the United States supported Trump and still does. They don't yeah. mind the lies. They don't mind the cruelty. They don't mind any of it. There is a fascist, nationalist um, way of thinking of a lot of people who are no, uh, who have less of a vision of what the world is and no vision of history and who have guns. This is a country where people can buy gun in the in Walmart. And yet you choose to live in that country. I came to the United States because I fell in love with a man who was my husband for 28 years. Yeah. By then, my son and my grandchildren were here. And, and now I married Roger. So probably we will have one foot in Chile and one foot here when we get older. But right now with the pandemic and everything, we're just stuck here. <laughs> but I know um, the United States is a country with, that is so different. I mean, it's a country that has many nations within this nation. Yeah, yeah. Usha Maher, she asks, wants to ask you a question. You said many women are afraid in this system of patriarchy. As a feminist colleague writer, this is also what I see. What can you say to women, what they can do to overcome this fear? I also use my anger as fuel, but many, many women do not dare to feel their anger and suppress their unease. Well, that's what the feminist movement has to achieve, still to achieve, but we've done, we've come a long way. And how, what do we do so that women will not feel, feel afraid? We have to fight for our, for our safety. We have to name things without euphemisms. We have to change the narrative. When I say there is an undeclared war against women, let's say it aloud many, many times. Let's talk about why women are afraid. What mm -hmm. makes them afraid? And is it reasonable to be afraid or not? And we have to change the culture so that we can change the DNA of women so that they can be born free and without fear. We still have a long way to go. Yeah. One last question from Sandra de Beer, and I know the answer sort of is written in the book, but perhaps she hasn't read it yet. What do you, why do you like to be married? What's so attractive of being married? I, die, I like to be with someone yeah. and I am heterosexual. So it has to be a man, unfortunately, because women are much more interesting. But, but being heterosexual, I have a man in my life and I like to be, to be with someone. I like the intimacy, the company, the complicity of a relationship. I didn't want to get married this time, of course, it was crazy, but Roger is a very formal person and he comes from a very formal background. He has five children, grandchildren. And one of the grandchilds, Anna, was seven years old and she goes to the librarian in her school and says, Miss, have you heard of Isabel Allende? And the librarian says, yes, yes, I've read some of her books. There is a pause. And then the child says, she's sleeping with my grandfather. So, <laughs> So Roger said, we have to get married because this is not a good example for the grandchildren. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Well, um, somebody already wrote in the chat and I fully agree with her that words are definitely to take home forever. Are, we're all improvising in life. I think if there's one <laughs> lesson uh, taught from this interview, it's that. Thank you so much uh, for being you, with us thank tonight. You. Thank you. Thank you so much and good luck in the pandemic in America with Roger. Don't kill each other. Last yeah, long, okay. last happy, <laughs> last in love. And thank you, um, listeners. Yeah, and, good luck. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.